Hello everyone, welcome to the webinar. My name is Nguyen Tran. I'm a product engineering manager here at Forza. Today's topic for this webinar is about common digital CMOS image sensor signal interfaces. Uh, this is going to be on digital interfaces and not analog interfaces, which require an off-chip ADC to convert that data from analog to digital. Then later in the slides, I'll also be going over some lessons learned from the years of experience I have from system prototyping uh, around our various image sensor design portfolio from small image sensors to high bandwidth designs. We'll be going over some hardware suggestions and firmware and software suggestions to help with the test system bring up to reduce headaches and just overall going over some examples of some of the things we've seen and how we rectified it. Here's a slide with some of my background information. So you can call me Nguyen or Nguyen Tran. My title here at Forza is Product Engineering Manager, like I mentioned previously. Uh, currently, my team is responsible for designing all the test systems for all the image sensors that our design team uh, creates here at Forza. So that test system will be used for characterization, qualification, wafer sort. Uh, some more background information, I've been with the company for 10 years. I came here straight out of college. I, my first position was a characterization engineer where I was given a test system. I captured images, analyzed them, and made sure the performance was up to par against the design specifications of that chip. Years later, I became an RTL FPGA designer, mainly using Verilog. I worked with the design, the digital design group on digital blocks for CMOS image sensors. And then I also worked on firmware for test systems at the time. Then I became a product engineer. So I followed new projects from beginning to end, uh, making suggestions in the design phase of anything for uh, helping with bring up or any test features that would be relevant to the customer in their specifications and then also i was responsible for at that time making the decisions around the test systems and putting that all together and then eventually i was in that position long enough and i became a product engineering manager so now i lead a group to do what i was doing as an individual so here's the agenda for the slides we already went through my introduction. I'll go through a Forza background introduction. Then we'll jump into some common image sensor electrical interfaces that you will come and see. Then we'll go into what goes into test platform planning, uh, how I, I do it here at Forza, and what considerations need to be taken into account. And then we'll go into some lessons learned from the years of experience I have uh, for some more of our higher bandwidth designs and what kind of difficulties that we struggled with and had to figure out on our own. And then we'll open it up for questions at the end. I think the format is that uh, you guys can either uh, type into the chat, kind of have a live Q&A kind of going on. Uh, but if anything, you can wait till the end and we will gladly answer your questions. So here's a Venn diagram about all the services we provide here at Forza. So we're a turnkey solution for CMOS image sensor design. You can come to us with a concept and then we will help you build uh, the specifications for that. Then we'll work on the design eventually to tape out, which is uh, one through five. And then it, once the design has been taped out, we will get uh, real silicon for us to test which goes on to the right hand side. So these slides will focus on number six, which is prototype development. Uh, and then uh, after the prototype development has been finished, that allows us to have test electronics to do the rest of the activities from seven through 10. So here's a slide regarding some of the applications of where some of our sensors are currently being used. So in the cinematography, uh, prosumer high-end video market, in the medical fields, automotive applications, in the mobile market. So 
some things to highlight on the left side is uh, one of our highest bandwidth sensors are, is currently running at 800 gigabits per second. There's 166 CML ports on there. Um, and one of our smaller designs, it's running data off of a single SPI port readback running at 12 megabits per second. So we have a lot of designs in between. So this section is going to go over some of the electrical interfaces, like I said, in the agenda. The first interface that we'll go over is LVDS. As you can see, there's two diagrams, which are schematics for two implementations of an LVDS driver. Some pros of this is that it's low power, can tolerate large differences between TX and RX grounds. No AC coupling cap is required, and it's good for parallel data buses. So normally on our sensors that have LVDS, it's going to be a parallel data bus, meaning that you're going to have X number of data lanes, differential pairs, and that's going to be tied to a synchronous clock that comes out with the data. Uh, some of the disadvantages of this is that the switching path of current creates supply noise, so this can only work up to a certain amount, certain speed, right? And here, theoretically, it can, it can work up to 2 gigabits per second. Uh, and then since there's a source synchronous clocking in the parallel buses, it doesn't tolerate skew very well when data speeds go up. So in our portfolio, I think the fastest speed using this interface is about 900 megabits per second. Anything faster than that, we have switched over to the next interface, which is CML. So as mentioned before, for faster designs, at Forza, we use CML out, uh, outputs instead of LVDS. So anything greater than 900 megabits per second, we use this. Uh, this you, you can see here there's two schematic the driver implementation examples. Uh, this is not, CML is not based on a standard. It's very fast compared to LVDS. Uh, that the reasons for that is that the differential pair can only pull down, so no slow PMOS transistors are required. Uh, there being no standards means that the designer has some freedom in increasing currents and reducing the R load. Uh, only NMOS also means that rise and fall times can be better engineered than LVDS, so that means less distortion in I diagrams and lower bit errors. Since it only syncs current, uh, there's better signal integrity due to the lower disturbance on supplies. So this slide will go over one of the interfaces that we have on some of our sensors it is the SPI. So those not familiar with SPI, that's just a serial communication protocol. Uh, normally it's a four wire solution. So you would only have the CS bar, S clock, MOSI and MISO. And only the MISO is used for readback. But since uh, we had first implemented this, we have a quad SPI version of this now. So as mentioned before, uh, one of our sensors can transfer data at 12 megabits per second. With the quad version, you can theoretically get up to six megabytes per second. So that is one interface that you can use. Obviously, the pro of this is that you don't have to have dedicated data outputs or clock pins. So if you are you don't have a lot of room for additional pads, this could be one solution. But that the big con here is that obviously your frame rate and data uh, throughput needs to be low enough th so that the bandwidth of this data output uh, can is greater than that unless you don't mind not having a readout of all the frames right but this is I like, this is one solution that someone can entertain if uh, if they're really strapped for space so the last interface we'll talk about is MIPI this is widely used in the mobile market Currently, there's two implementations of this. So there's a DeFi and a CFi. The differences between two is a DeFi is kind of like an LVDS interface where the, there's parallel data outputs, and then there's a differential clock that goes with those outputs. For the CFi, it's more like an AP10B protocol where the data line has the clock embedded in it. So there is no dedicated clock that needs to go with that data. So as you can see here, the number of data lines that are required for MIPI, uh, I think the maximum is about four lanes of data for the DeFi and six lanes of data for the CFi. So the amount of pads required is low. Uh, it's low power, 
and uh, most processors nowadays have a native support for MIPI. So for example, the test platform that we'll be talking about for MIPI that we're using has a dedicated connector for MIPI. And of course, they'll provide you with example MIPI drivers and even have a example code for an off-the-shelf MIPI sensor for you to reference. So the interesting he thing here with MIPI is that uh, the data output actually switches between two types of signal interfaces. One is a low speed, which doesn't have any termination, and then it switches to a high speed, which is almost like an LVDS type of uh, in signal interface, which it, which it does switch on a uh, 100 ohm differential termination and does that dynamically. So that's one thing that you have to take into account uh, when implementing test hardware for this. But if you're using a processor, that, that termination is taken care of for you. But if you're doing it any other way, um, you need to take that into account. So the next section here, we'll be going over test platform planning. Uh, so this is kind of going through my head of, you know, when I get a new uh, image sensor design specification uh, and their, its performance, I have to plan out uh, what the sensor board needs and test system hardware requirements are. Here are some test, test platform considerations that we have here at Forza whenever we start a new uh, test system design. Uh, so here at Forza we use off-the-shelf FPGA boards uh, instead of fully custom ones. Those are very expensive and these ones work just fine for our requirements. Uh, so the first thing uh, that we go over for the daughter board design. So these FPGA develop board, development boards have a daughter board connector that you can uh, run your signals to and from uh, the FPGA. So the first thing we do is look at the user guide, make sure we understand what the power requirements are of the sensor. We identify LDOs for each of the power supply domains uh, and make sure the LDOs have enough current carrying capabilities for each supply. Another thing we do is that we don't share supply domains for supplies that have the same voltage potential. Uh, that's to make sure it's as clean as possible and also for debugging purposes we'd like to keep them all separate so if we want to drive a voltage externally uh, we can do so without having to complicate it with any other supplies. Another thing that you need to be mindful of are all the digital and analog inputs to the sensor. Make sure all inputs are driven. Don't leave anything floating. Uh, we like to have everything programmable from the FPGA if, if, uh, if that's, that can be done. Or you can have something on the board like a dip switch, but we, we recommend it definitely from the FPGA and so you don't have to touch the board at all. So the least number of times you have to touch the board or modify it, that's, that's uh, good on your, in our book. Then the next couple considerations kind of choose you choose which development board you're gonna use in your test system. So currently we have two that we work with. It's mostly Xilinx boards. So the first one's a VCU118 which has an ultra scale plus uh, FPGA on there and there's a ML605 which has a vertex 6 part. It's kind of an older design. So the main differences here are the what we call the GTY or GTX transceivers that are available on each design. Uh, so these transceivers can work up to 28 gig gigabits per second on the Ultra Scale Plus, and the GTX version of that uh, can work up to 6 gigabits per second. So for, for higher speed designs that are greater than 1 gigabit per second for the data lines, uh, we would use these interfaces and depending on how many of them there are, uh, you would choose one or the other. So for lower speed designs, for like uh, LVDS parallel data outputs, uh, you could use either design. Uh, you just need to make sure there's enough pins in the IOs uh, for you to use, right? So if you have, uh, so each of these FMC connectors that are on these FPGA boards, they have a minimum of 160 single-ended IOs that you can program. Uh, the M the VCU118 has a FMC Plus, which has even more IOs. So you just need to plan around what what 
you require, how many pins you have, uh, and basically make a decision on which of these two uh, that you would use. Obviously, there's there's more outside of these two, but these are the main ones that we use here at Forza. And then the next consideration that you have is once once you grab the data into the FPGA, how do you get that data off the FPGA to the PC? So right now we have two ways to do that here at Forza. One is through uh, Camera Link, which is a a widely used specification for um, data transfer from the FPGA to the PC using a frame grabber, or you can just use PCI Express. So Camera Link is widely used standard uh, and can be easily set up for live view and downloading frames into the PC. There's minimal development time. Everything is kind of provided for you. Uh, you just need to make sure that the FPGA has the cores set up, basically the code set up to transfer the data to the camera link frame grabbers. Uh, and that's pretty much it. You just have to choose what kind of configuration you have. So the the fastest that we here have here at Forza is dual full base. So it's just two, two full channels uh, going to two frame grabbers on the PC. And that's has a throughput of 1.36 gigabytes per second. The PCIe implementation currently runs at about five gigabytes per second uh, so the bottleneck here is that normally we have a lot lot of data that's greater than five gigabytes per second so how that looks like as i'll go over in more detail later for that system that use pcie data is saved into ddr4 memory and then that ddr4 memory is read out to the pc raw in raw data format to through the pci express and that has a five gigabyte per second bottleneck. So you won't be quite getting live data from the image sensor, but in this case, you can get a semi-live update by downloading from the same frame buffers in the memory. Uh, I'll go over it in more detail what that looks like later. Okay. so. This is a block diagram of our ML605 platform that we currently have in-house. Uh, we call this a legacy platform. Platform We've been using this for years. I think since I first joined, we had a platform that looked like this. Um, so I'll just go over the parts here. So there's a PC. This is the dual full camera link implementation of this system. So we have two frame grabbers here. You have four camera link cables that go to this daughter card slot. So like I mentioned, this NL605 has two daughter card slots. Uh, this is an a internal board that was developed by Forza that has the two full camera link outputs. The sensor board, which will have the sensor uh, on it. In this case, mostly that's that's done by having a socket and then having having a off-the-shelf uh, ceramic package that fits into that socket, the PGA pin. Then the sensor board provides everything that sensor needs, uh, which is supply uh, voltages, references. Uh, then it routes all the digital signals from the FPGA level shifted to the sensor uh, at the correct IO voltage input. And from there, uh, the data will come from the sensor, be downloaded into the FPGA. And for this case, there is no intermediate uh, holding point. We don't have any memory here on, on the FPGA other than FIFOs. So once that data comes into the FPGA, uh, then it gets formatted for the camera link output and it goes straight to the PC to be downloaded and saved. So here's a block diagram of the firmware for this system. Uh, so basically you have the LVDS parallel data and clock coming into this block and this for this example there's a top and bottom ports they're essentially identical they're just two pairs of these uh, the first thing it hits is what we call the sensor phi which is the physical layer so the data goes into the iSERDES IP core that Xilinx provides uh, that data then goes into a calibration loop so one thing 
that needs to be done is you need to make sure that the data being captured by the FPGA uh, is latching the data in the middle of the eye, and then also it needs to be word calibrated, right? So this data is usually to some bit width, so 10 bits, 12 bits, 16 bits, uh, etc. You need to make sure that the data that you're receiving is along being received by the same word boundaries that the sensor is actually working off of, right? So that's we'll go on. I'll go into more details about bit calibration, word calibration later. But once you confirm that your data is correct and that it's something that a receiver or a decoder can uh, make sense of, then it will go through the receiver, which will decode uh, the valid data in the stream of data being sent to the FPGA. That data will go to a data buffer. Uh, then that's where the clock domain crossing will happen between the sensor clock to the FPGA clock. And that and this data readout core is responsible for formatting the data to be sh shipped through the camera link uh, output. These other uh, blocks here, so there's a clock tree, reset tree that happens here. And how we control our test system is that from the PC and the camera link interface, there's a UART over camera link. So UART, uh, we're able to talk to a internal register space uh, this register space basically controls all the parameters and register uh, controls that we have for all the blocks here and also has the controls over the SPI masters or I squared CG masters for the center. So that's how we talk to the chip. We configure the chip first. Uh, our sensors usually have a image or go option for internal trigger. Uh, here not pictured, but if the sensor needs an external frame timer, this is also where, where it will be. And it'll also be configured by the FPGA register space. Uh, so how this would look is that you would set up the sensor through SPI. Then once you have, we would calibrate the data lines on the idle codes. Uh, and then once we're ready to capture data, we would set the image or go. The frames would start coming in. Uh, if everything is was calibrated correctly and everything received is what we expect it will pass the receiver into the data buffer and automatically go to the camera link which you will see a live image on the pc the next platform that we have here is the vcu 118 we call it the lionel system i didn't come up with that name that was already just made already this is the ultra scale plus system so the system here you'll see in the diagram there's two VCU 118s. You don't necessarily need to, but this is just to highlight that it is modular. So as as many PCI Express uh, ports that you have on your motherboard, you can have that many VCU 118s uh, attached to it. Uh, each FPGA has 24 GTY transceivers uh, available on it. So in, in this implementation, uh, we would have 48 total that we could use uh, at the same time. So again, uh, the FPGA boards are connected to the sensor boards. Uh, that's done through a cable to cable connector that we purchase off the shelf. And then both of these FPGAs are connected to the PC using a PCI Express riser cable. Again, the sensor board here um, acts the same way, uh, provides everything the sensor needs for it to operate. Uh, all the signals are only coming from the master board. So these FPGAs are exactly the same, but uh, only one of these boards control the serial interface to the sensor and to any of the peripherals on the sensor board. Uh, so this is kind of what it looks like here. So uh, the PC will issue PCI Express commands to the master, which has all the controls for the serial interfaces to the sensor board uh, and then frames are downloaded into each of the respective FPGA boards DDR4 memory and then once the recordings are done they're downloaded through the PCI Express interface to the PC. So here's a block diagram of the Lionel firmware these blocks are going to look very familiar in the very beginning. There's going to be a phi portion, which is going to take the serialized data lines to parallel data out. There's a calibration uh, algorithm that happens here that needs to finish 
uh, before having that data go to the receiver. Uh, then once the data lanes have been calibrated, uh, frame data will be kicked off by the serial interface to the chip. So again, an example would be to have the imager go or frame start happen on the on the sensor via SPI or I2C. Data would be coming in. The receiver would decode that data, uh, then format that data uh, into a buffer. Uh, what's not pictured here is a cl clock domain crossing buffer that happens uh, so that there's a time domain crossing that happens from the sensor to the uh, AXI interface that's used here to, to, to the DMA. So that then that data goes to the DMA to be saved into the DDR memory, memory as I mentioned before. And then later after the recording is done, the PC host will request to read that data from the DDR for memory. Uh, so we have a similar setup here where the PC communicates to the local register spaces in, in the FPGA for configuration or uh, controlling any of the peripherals like the SPI master or external frame timer. Uh, and then it also going to request data from the DDR for memory. And the last platform we have here at Forza is the uh, platform that we use for MIPI. So we have an IMX8 processor platform uh, that we have currently used for one of our MIPI projects. Uh, this, there's a, this is from Freescale. Uh, it's a evaluation kit, which is a board uh, that has a connector specifically for MIPI. So this mini SAS connector that we refer to here, that's the one that's used for MIPI. Uh, there's a sensor board over here that provides everything, like I, like I mentioned in the other sensor boards, it provides everything that the sensor needs. And then that data output uh, for the data lanes and the clock need to go through a buffer board that we have. Uh, and then that buffer board has that data and clock go to the connector on the Freescale plat test platform board. So uh, notes here, there's some the very low number of signals required uh, that connectors is pretty small. The only thing that's on there is the data, the clocks, I square C and a couple uh, power supply nets from the evaluation board. Uh, Freescale provides a lot of example designs, documentations. We worked off of a reference uh, design that they made with an off the shelf MIPI board that we purchased and we, uh, the software engineer brought up the design, got that working, uh, and then uh, was starting to work on our design. So that that proved useful as a starting point. But one thing to point out here is that uh, even for our senior level software engineer, he, he found it that there was a very high learning curve. There's all the source files are provided to you, meaning that you can make all the changes you want, but there's thousands of files that are being made and uh, Freescale of course offers their services for any help if you need help to make any modifications for your design. Uh, here's just a block diagram of the CSI interface here uh, for the DeFi implementation. So this is taken from the Freescale user manual. Uh, so just another, more things to highlight here. There's no wizards for setting this up. There's no IP cores, like for example, for Xilinx. So uh, most of this stuff you're gonna have to do on your own if, if you don't enlist the help of Freescale. Um, but uh, it's not impossible. So our, our software design engineer uh, worked on this very hard and he was able to get it to work for our uh, image sensor design. Uh, one thing I'll point out later that helped out a lot was that uh, he was able to emulate the test uh, system before the chip came back. So we had hardware that allowed us to uh, emulate the DeFi uh, MIPI interface with the hardware before the chip came back. So I think that helped out a lot in his development of this test system. Okay, so the next uh, section here, I'll go over some lessons learned and uh, things that I think proved very useful in my time here at Forza and, and making my life easier and my team's uh, life easier. Uh, 
Um, so some simple things, you know, not to forget, and then some interesting things that we went through. So for hardware considerations, uh, so for high speed applications, you know, it's always, whether it's high speed or low speed, you should always adhere to these um, considerations. So termination on all differential data lines, make sure there is termination where they're required. Uh, for example, for the FPGA, I think I had to write it down in a checklist that to make sure that all the differential data lane inputs had a termination from the FPGA on there. We typically don't put that uh, on the board since the FPGA already has a, a programmable one. Uh, but to keep in mind that just because uh, I had to learn this a couple times, but just because I put the specification to turn it on in a sp specific place, I thought that it was on in the final implementation, but always check your pad reports in the, in the FPGA firmware uh, generation where I put it for some reason it didn't, maybe it was like out of, uh, order or there was something else that took precedent or precedent over it but where i put it it didn't seem to stick so i had to change where i put it and eventually the report said that there was termination so that's an easy thing to to miss and it's easy to also identify when you have the system up and running when you probe the data lanes the swing will look totally out of whack not in the range that you expect so that's the first thing to kind of look for if you're having problems with um, data not being received properly into the FPGA. And following on that note, AC-DC coupling, make sure you understand which type of coupling you're using and uh, choosing the correct one according to the data sheet and the recommendations from the designers uh, of your image sensors. Uh, and then just make sure you do proper planning uh, for some data lanes, like for example, a GTX, GTY, those are pin locked. You cannot move where those are. So don't blindly just assign data lanes to pins that you think can be configured for GTX. Uh, understand that those are locked and you can't, if you created a hardware design where they were assigned to something that weren't GTX, you're kind of out of luck. You have to respin that design. Uh, ensure data traces for data lanes are length matched and skew matched. Uh, they're impedance controlled and, and isolated. Make sure your stack up, make sure that they're isolated from any noisy supplies or nets that you have, any high current draw supplies, especially. Um, separate the power domains if you can. Uh, dedicated LDOs with bypass options. That's what we do for every one of our designs. Uh, have on the board some way to adjust these voltages just in case you need to overdrive it or maybe reduce it. Um, and then programmability for all digital IO. So if you're gonna be providing some uh, output from the FPGA, just make sure you can control it through the FPGA register space or something that, that has proven very helpful for debug and just future-proofing any optimization later down the road. So I kind of going to go through uh, the Eisterdes Phi implementation for LVDS inputs. So here's a snapshot of a wizard and how to set one up on a new design. Uh, so there's some input parameters that are obviously going to be asked for, like how fast the speed of the data is coming in. Uh, for instance, here. They are also asking for the PLL input clock frequency. So for this uh, wizard, it's actually creating a, a clock to sample that data. Uh, there's also different configurations. You can also use the data clock as well. Um, but everything else on here, you can probably read the documentation for that. I just want to highlight uh, for this implementation, like I mentioned before, calibration. Uh, so the Data is coming in with the clock, and there's inev inevitably going to be some skew between the clock and data. And especially if you have eight data lanes, uh, separate data lanes, all the skews of them are all going to be all over the place. Right? You have to assume the worst. And since you only have one clock for eight data lanes, uh, they have a way so that you can try to delay each of the data lanes to the clock. 
so we call that internally here bit calibration. So uh, bit calibration is to make sure that you are capturing the data in the middle of the eye for each of the data lanes, right? So we, we typically treat each data lane independently of one another. Uh, so there is a uh, something called a data slip feature that Xilinx has. So basically it has an, something called an IO delay cell, which passes the, the serialized data input through a buffer and you can control how much delay there is. Uh, so you would obviously keep the clock the same uh, as it is, and you're able to delay the clock by a certain amount, right? So that allows you to kind of move this clock, this data around compared to the clock. And uh, we would use this with a normal training pattern. So normally on our sensors, the data output uh, during idle, or even with a test pattern, you could set it to be some known, you know, sequence of bits, right? Uh, for example, we, we can make this like five, 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 right? A 12 bit value of five, five, five. So you know that every other bit should be a one or a zero. Uh, and then uh, the kind of the loop that happens here is that we set it to some, what we call a tap, which is basically some sort of delay setting. And then we would sample 12 bits, right? We don't care at this point it, that it's not word calibrated. We just know that there's a pattern and any shifted version of that pattern we would accept, right? So if it's 555 or AAA, uh, we would accept that as being valid, right? And then we would kind of do something called a shmoo plot, which is basically map out um, what taps are valid, which always return a valid uh, value back and kind of map that out. And then we would choose uh, obviously, there would be areas where it, if the clock and data is lined up uh, right on the edge, it would be metastable. So every time you read that back, it would either come back with a a a a five or something something off, right? Something that's not right. Uh, and then uh, it'll wrap around to eventually, once that clock period has been uh, swept enough, you would see that it's valid again, right? Um, so after the shmoo plot has been done, uh, we would pick the place where it's most stable, obviously in the middle of where there is a bunch of valid settings. And then after that, we would do word calibration. And in word calibration is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, you need to align the data to uh, the 12 bits or whatever, how many bits that are valid from the sensor. So for example, you could make the, now the test pattern output, uh, let's say eight, zero one so now from your 12-bit output you know that there should be a one at the very uh, at, the, at the msb and one at the lsb so you would keep shifting your bits around until you receive that pattern right so after your output pattern matches with what you expect on the 12-bit level 14-bit level etc then you're considered calibrated so you now you've made sure at the end of this exercise that you're latching data in the middle of the eye for every data lane, and also making sure that you're on the word boundary of what the data, uh, what the sensor is operating on. Okay, for GTX, uh, here's also an example of the wizard and what kind of input parameters you can put to it. Uh, obviously the line rate. Uh, so an important thing for GTX is that you have to provide it a reference clock that reference clock will go into a pll to generate a clock fast enough to um, sample your data data at the rate that you specify so some things that we learned here right so you need to make sure the reference clock is asynchronous to the center uh, one thing while we were debugging one of our other designs uh, one of our newer designs at the time uh, running at 5.6 gigabits per second we we're noticing that the receiver was having a hard time uh, locking to the data, right? We weren't sure why it would uh, calibrate and then all of a sudden lose lock and sync. And we were questioning the receiver, right? Because the data lanes looked like they were okay. Um, at the time, we didn't see anything that strange. So uh, we we thought as a group, Oh, why why don't we put a synchronous clock to the reference clock? Because you know, if there's any, we were kind of questioning 
uh, if the input clock was kind of having some jitter on it and you know what why don't we use that same clock as a reference clock because you can actually program any reference clock uh, into the GTX core that you have so you can actually specify what clock you want and then it will come up with the fractional PLL settings for to accept that clock uh, so that's what we did uh, as an experiment to see, you know, if it, if the input clock is jittering or getting hit with something or has some disturbance on it, you know, that that jitter should uh, be synchronous with the sensor data output, and you know, it should help with locking onto the data if they're if you know it's true. But what we found is that when you do that, it is completely unusable. Uh, so the what we think here that's happening is that um, yeah there might be some disturbance on the input clock and what the GTX transceiver is trying to do is it has its own algorithm for trying to latch data uh, in the middle of the eye so it has its own algorithm it's not necessarily clock data recovery uh, because clock data recovery needs to be used uh, with some type of protocol, for example, AB10B. Uh, when I looked into this further and started debugging it, uh, the the way that we're currently using it right now, we're using the raw encoding. There's no encoding. We have we latch the bits directly and then decode it after the fact, because we're using 64, 66 bit encoding, and so we have a decoder after the uh, GTX implementation. So even with without the clock data recovery, um, I we I the reading that I've done so far is that it has a elastic buffer that it tries to latch in the data and it has its own count of whether or not it can recover the data even if there is jitter and having the clock synchronous to the sensor kind of messes with that uh, so my recommendation for a reference clock it should be asynchronous to the chip uh, to the sensor that you're evaluating and also to use a PLL, a programmable PLL with jitter attenuating uh, uh, capability. So currently we're using the SI5326, uh, which has worked out great. Uh, we haven't had any issues with using that on any of our designs. Um, and so that's, that's one recommendation that we have and that we found out uh, through our experimentation. And then another th cool thing to point out is that the Xilinx, uh, debug core has an eye diagram tool so you, you'll see a figure here that's kind of an example eye diagram that you have blue is where the bits are valid and as it gets to closer from green to red that's where the transitions are happening uh, so this was useful for us when we're we're optimizing the cml output drivers we have uh, current drive settings uh, and also playing with the pll settings you could see that eye open up uh, as we change the settings and it's a quick and dirty way to to see on the fly uh, how well those settings are working out but what it doesn't capture is any very fast events so one of the another example of one of the troubles that we went through is on on that same design that we're trying to debug the high speed output for the first time there was actually a very fast event uh, happening where the tolerance of the jitter was outside of the what the GTX could handle, right? Um, so G the GTX transceiver can actually handle quite a lot of jitter if, as long as it's low frequency, um, like maybe in the megahertz range. Uh, but any fast events that happen, it cannot recover. And what that manifests itself uh, on our test system was that it lost a bit. Uh, so once that bit is lost, the 6466 uh, encoder that we have kind of gets thrown to, through a loop and it doesn't know where the valid data is anymore. So that's kind of how it manifests itself on our system. Um, but once we were able to optimize the PLL uh, performance and CML driver output performance, uh, we didn't have to change anything on the GTX side. Everything was working fine. So the next thing here is that uh, as far as tolerances go, we the first thing while we were debugging this problem was ask Xilinx. Uh, 
because none of the data sheets would actually specify what the jitter tolerances was. There was no spec for that and they wouldn't sign up for one, right? So we had to reach out to them and ask them repeatedly if they have any information of what kind of jitter tolerances they have and they gave us the below. So for low speeds here, uh, the jitter tolerance uh, UI is a unit intervals, right? So for one period or one symbol, this is how much it can tolerate. And for low speeds and the kilohertz, it's, it's actually pretty robust. But as you go faster and faster, um, it's starting to look about like one unit interval, right? So about one period. So we were definitely going outside of this range. Um, and it made sense with what this data looked like after the fact, right? So as you go faster and faster, the amount of jitter that the GTX transceiver can tolerate is definitely not as much. Uh, so just keep it, keep in mind if you're debugging a new sensor, this is something that can happen and you'll need to make sure that whether, whether it's the transceiver that's having a problem with the data or actually the data come from the chip. And in this case, what we were debugging was something coming from the chip. Which leads me to my last uh, slide, which is very important. One of the biggest things that we have implemented here at Forza is the um, task of emulation. So oh, before when we brought up chips, it would take about two weeks on average, uh, all hands on deck to try to get our first image out. Um, but since then, uh, one of the things that I am trying to reduce is the bring up time. So it, our bring up times have from first sil silicon have ranged from anywhere from a couple hours to a couple days for our much larger complicated designs. So that's something that we're very proud about. And of course, when a customer uh, has a chip taped out, the first thing they want to see is an image. So this has definitely helped uh, make our customers happy and also and get, uh, you know, we hit the ground running uh, into characterization and stuff like that. So what emulation is here at Forza, what we do is uh, since luckily we are the designers of our chips, we have the RTL from the digital blocks already available to us. So we're able to make a very accurate sensor model that we can load onto an FPGA. Uh, that data output will then go to another FPGA, which is going to be the same FPGA that is going to be receiving the data in our test platform. So um, this is not really a test of the electrical interface itself. Obviously, it's going to be connected through a board-to-board -board cable, uh, but it does uh, validate everything downstream, right? Make sure your firmware, your receiver, uh, data downloading, all the software is ready. Making sure your, your data interface, all your pins for your FPGAs are placed in the right place. Make sure the termination is there. It really checks off all the things that should be checked off before the chip comes back. Because one of the reasons why this is so successful is that it makes sure that you are debugging the chip and not your test system. Uh, I think uh, looking back at all the lessons learned all the bring ups of all the other sensors before we did emulation, uh, most of the time we were confusing things that we thought was a sensor, but really was the, the test platform. And really separating those out really does make it clear and make it a more focused effort of chip bring up so that uh, you don't get, because when these things become convolved, it becomes a really big mess to untwine, un, you know, untangle, right? So that's basically the biggest thing that I can recommend for anyone trying to create a new test platform around a new sensor as particularly a brand new sensor that's never been brought up before that really helps out a lot. And then, uh, yeah, like I mentioned before in the MIPI, uh, we were able to have hardware that emulated the DeFi data interface uh, to the actual processor that we were going to use. And I think that really, really helped also with the bring up of that design. I think our customer was very happy and impressed with how how fast we brought that up. Uh, and most of the time our customers also try to bring up their hardware as well. And we usually beat them to it too. So that's also something to add confidence into uh, what we're doing and uh, the steps we're taking to make sure not only that, you know, we have the design up and running, 
to, but to make sure that there aren't any bugs or anything like that as well. But of course, if you don't have the RTL code available, you, you're not stuck, right? You just need to have, make sure you have a good user guide for that chip. And then you can easily make a model based off of timings and everything that the chip should have. And you should be in a better uh, shape having that than not. So that's kind of the conclusion of the slides. Uh, to access this webinar and other videos, you can visit us at this web link here uh, for Forza's video resource library.